Simon. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to what is, in fact, the sixth um, deeper dive webinar on the new IT for IT technical standard for the Open Group. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to serve as the chairman of the Open Group IT for IT Forum. And my role today is simply to facilitate the conversation that follows the presentation from Dwight David. Um, Dwight is a long-standing member of the IT for IT Forum and has been there since its formation um, when we launched the forum in London last October in 2014, October before last now, and published the standard uh, this October just passed in 2015. So I will leave Dwight to introduce himself a little bit more fully, but important for you to understand Although a Hewlett Packard Enterprise employee, Dwight is in fact an internal customer. So his responsibilities, if you will, are broad in the context of the new standard, in the, as well as one of our treasured subject matter experts who's helped us deliver, to develop and deliver the substantial collateral that the um, reference architecture and their value streams comprise. He's also a consumer of this material, so he's uniquely placed both to provide this presentation, but also to respond to your questions from, if you will, a customer orientation. So without further ado, over to you, Dwight, and I'll uh, rejoin as your presentation ends, sir. Thank you very much, Chris. I'm excited to be presenting and delving into the Detect to Correct value stream today. I view this particular value stream as really where the rubber meets the road in IT. And I think by the end of this presentation, uh, you will all agree with me that in fact, that is what uh, detects the correct uh, value stream uh, actually is. What are we gonna be talking about today? Well, the full purpose of this webinar is to shine the spotlight on this critical value stream of uh, detect the correct. We will talk about how it actually contributes to the overall IT for IT value chain what are the essential components within that value stream? And then we also uh, highlight the business value. How are we gonna spend our time today? This is how I want to approach uh, our time divided into really uh, six areas. We're gonna do a quick introduction of, uh, maybe it's a re quick review for most of you of the value chain, the support and service model and reference architecture. Then we'll look at the phases and activities within our particular value stream of the tech to correct. Uh, we'll take a look from the level two reference architecture of uh, Detect to Correct, then talk about the value proposition. And I do have a call to action for you. So at the end, I expect you to take some action and we'll talk about that. And certainly we welcome your comments, questions, uh, suggestions uh, at the end. So let's uh, dig uh, right into the IT values chain. Now, I know most of you have actually seen this, but when I see this, two things really come to mind, which is really around the principles that uh, the general value chain concept brings. One is no one activity can be completely optimized. So instead of isolating and optimizing a single step, if you try to do that, it actually sub-optimizes the whole value chain. So in terms of IT, it means that the thicker the wall that we build between our IT silos, then the harder it is to create an optimized IT organization. This is one principle, right? We need to deal with the whole organization, optimize the whole organization to get the benefit. The second thing, which is also reflected in this value chain, is that some of the activities, they support all the value streams within that chain. So for example, take human resources. We would need human resources across each of the value streams. So those are really the two things that really come to mind for me when I actually uh, see this. In general, value chain frameworks, you know, they help the organization identify activities which are essential to attaining their business goal. Within here for IT for IT, we provide the capabilities of actually managing the business of IT will enable the execution across the entire value chain, but not only, not only that, do it better, do it faster, and in a cheaper way with less risk. So as you can see from 
uh, the diagram it, it includes really uh, two major areas the the primary um, the primary set of activities which are depicted at the top as uh, you know strategy to portfolio requirements to deploy request to fulfill and uh, detect uh, to correct uh, affectionately known in the industry as plan bill uh, deliver and run and we know definitely the deliver part is relatively new because IT organizations are already moving to service providers. And if your organization is not doing that, I'm almost guaranteed that in order to keep up with the way the industry is changing, that you will certainly, in this user-centric type of uh, environment in which we are today, you will certainly need to do that. So deliver being a, a critical aspect um, within the value chain. And certainly there are the supporting activities, which is really makes up the second part of uh, the two-part section within the, the, the value chain. At the heart, really, of uh, this value chain, we have the reference architecture. And then what makes the reference architecture work, what I would call the DNA of that reference architecture is the IT service model. Really, if we think about organizations today, you know, including my own, one of the things that we really want to get is end-to-end -end traceability throughout the org. This is really what the IT service model enables. Here it's depicted as a uh, service life cycle across the value streams. And by life cycle, what I'm suggesting is that it's a set of activities around the service models that we have. It's things like you know, continuous assessment, uh, continuous development, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment. You know, today in our industry, oftentimes uh, we focus uh, specifically on the realized service you know, what's actually running. Um, but I would say we need to change our view. We really need to expand that view that we have of a service. So really, what do I mean by that? I mean that we need to, from the planning stage, take into concept that this, the service model could be conceptual. So this is where the business determines what needs to be addressed. You know, who are our customers? What is the value that it provides what it provides to them. Then we take that into a set of uh, requirements or user stories. This is what you're seeing here, while it's straddle strategy to portfolio versus uh, requirements to deploy. The example that I really like to use is an email system. So conceptually, if I'm a business and I need an email system, I say, hey, I need to be able to communicate internally and externally. I may want a calendar. I may have 5,000 users. They may be scattered throughout the world. All of those really are is the concept of needing that email system. When I send those requirements into um, uh, to requirements to deploy or R2D, then that is then taken and, and made into a logical mode. So I can make the determination for my email system, I'm not going to write something. I'm not going to buy, but I'm going to use Hewlett Packard Enterprise with its O365 offering from Microsoft to run not in the Microsoft data center, but in my own data center or in the HPE's data center. And so that would then turn into the, the logical view of that email system. Then once we, you know, deploy that system, that is when it turns into the realized model. So we have it in our data center, we are configuring it. And now I can go to my service catalog and actually order a mailbox. So you can see from that that it gives you that end-to-end -end view. Finally, you know, as we order and I order my, my mailbox, uh, you can see that it helps to enable that end-to-end -end traceability from the conceptual view of the model for my mailbox all the way to me actually running that mailbox and ensuring that it, it, it continues to run. There is, so what are the objects? What are the data objects that actually support? Because there's data behind that, there's a model behind it, there's also integrations that we need in order to support that life cycle. And this is exactly where the reference architecture uh, comes into play. This is an overall view of the it it reference architecture. Again, the focus on this architecture is the data and the functional components. It's not the focus, but not really the focus on the processes that compromise that comprise really these activities. So, any organization, any method that you have within that organization, any processes 
that you have, we understand and know that those will change over time. But the underlying data that we have of that service life cycle, that will remain, that will remain constant. So let's uh, dig into really how we can um, understand the notation that we have within this reference architecture. By the way, there are, there are five levels that we have within this uh, IT4IT framework, and it's really geared so that uh, we can consume. So even somebody like me, I can understand um, really what these, these particular, you know, any of the levels and what they mean. So you can go from a, a geeky architect all the way to an executive with a minimal uh, IT background would be able to pick this up and, and understand it. So what we're looking at is really uh, level one, and the notation that we use in level one, there are just three of them that we need to understand, only three. Uh, the first one is uh, the blue boxes, where we have what's called functional components. So that really is an essential function that de delivers the service. And the rule says that each functional component can have a minimum or should have a minimal of one key data object. And the data object is what's represented by the black circle, which shows you really the, the life cycle of, of that particular object. It helps you to do, give you that end-to-end -end traceability of what occurs within that particular uh, functional component. And then the third one that we have is really the solid lines, which represent the relationships between uh, our data objects, the direct relationship between these objects. Yes, there is a fourth one, but it's really part of the uh, what we call the service backbone uh, data object. This is really a special uh, data object um, that really comes from the service model backbone. Remember I talked about the service model earlier? It keeps track of the real service uh, being delivered. This is what actually IT delivers, the actual services being delivered. So in our example um, earlier, in, in my case, and in, in D2C, it would, the actual service would be my my mail service. The key point that I always want to highlight and continue to highlight in, as we go through this is it's all about the data. So if we actually skin this uh, diagram and take off the functional components, uh, what we can see is the end-to-end -end nature of the data and, and of those relationships. We actually call this the system of record fabric for the, act, for the reference architecture. So where does the tech to correct actually fit in? Let's start by looking at the activities within uh, the tech to correct. We'll take a look in, in context of the overall um, value chain. So detect to correct is the run aspect of the, the value tree, the value stream. So at this point, the service has been deployed and the focus is on proactively preventing failures and when a failure occurs, being able to restore that service. So the detect to correct it really helps an organization bring IT operations together to enhance our results and enhance our efficiency and also reduce, reduce the risk that we have or may, may encounter. They really want to do, so the main thing is identifying something and fixing it before our, imp, our users are impacted. So specifically, uh, it's about keeping the services running. So in detect is really an early detection um, through a variety of means, and then it's across the entire uh, services that we offer. So whether it be a server, whether it be a, a cloud um, service that we have, storage network uh, application, or even the user experience on, an, on a mobile device. All of those are things that we need to be able to detect and as we detect them, uh, diagnose them, uh, identify what is wrong, so we can then maximize the ability to resolve the issue. We want to do that through automation and then implement change to ensure that that does not occur again and have it uh, fully uh, resolved. So let's uh, decompose um, detect the correct a little further. So all detect the correct phases, uh, they all contain IT processes and they all contain activities. And that's, you know, these are integrated throughout the, the service lifecycle. 
It begins when the upstream um, value stream, in this case, I request to fulfill, it completes the final phase and deploys the service. The service will be a large service or a small service. It could be a single one or it could be many consumers that we have. It really doesn't matter. It covers all of those types of scenarios. Service deployment really ensures that the proper monitors are deployed along with the service. So in the detect phase, what we are doing is identifying like early identification of anomalies that happen across the IT ecosystem. And again, I want to stress that it's not just limited to, to servers that may be on premise. It will also include your cloud providers. It can include that storage, um, your network, again, user experience, et cetera. And these, these particular monitors, they detect any changes that you have within the operating environment. And if the, the condition is important, when it's detected, you actually generate a notification of what we actually call an event. So the events are sent to the diagnostic system where diagnosis actually begins. What we mean by diagnostics is we are able to gather all the information around that specific problem uh, to determine, one, that it's real, and to really make sure that, and see if we can actually identify the root cause. You know, just imagine that, uh, another a quick example. You know, we just got back from um, a long vacation. Well, that's a, you know, a few weeks ago already, and we took a lot of pictures, and I wanted to share them over the mail system uh, with, a, with a colleague. And these are all you know, large raw files. And we have a couple of people doing things like that. Being able to realize you know, who these users are, what they are doing, is really some of the things that we help to do in, in diagnosis. And we want to do that before the service is actually impacted. That's really the key here. So when the service is interrupted, just in case it, it does and we didn't catch it, uh, we want to have the automation or standard practice that could initiate the restoration of the service availability at its uh, earliest time uh, when we can. So if the service um, can't be quickly restored, or if it could be quickly restored, there could be changes that are needed to ensure the long-term viability uh, of the issue. So we may say in the case of uh, uh, people sending these uh, one gig raw files, Maybe uh, a simple fix for that, we limit the, you know, the size of the attachment. Or we can have you know, larger, larger uh, pipes to, in order to ensure that we can facilitate uh, large file transfers. So those are the types of things that would happen and change. And then we want to get to resolve where uh, resolution controls the implementation of that change. And preferably, we want to leverage something like the run book, which is an automated mechanism to to actually resolve an issue and be able to reconcile that original change to the results. So these phases and their associated activity, these are critical in today's environment. We know that our environment uh, is changing, but we think that detect to correct from the work that we've done, from the people that we've talked to within the industry, uh, it's well placed to facilitate that. So really to understand how a user-centric world um, resolve issues, we can take a look at the four major phases that we have here in Detect to Correct and how they are impacted. We are moving today from really a localized, central, on-premise type of offering to really the next wave where it's more predictive, it's more dynamic. Um, we have, you know, the whole uh, DevOps movement, so things are happening faster. So we need to move with that, and we think that Detect to Correct facilitates that. Looking at uh, detect, you know, many of us remember our days, at least in in, in the operationals er, operational area, uh, reacting to issues, right? Uh, reacting to and reacting to them after a user calls, as opposed to before. You know, you can think of you know the scenario that I gave earlier, where you know I would say ask my colleague, "Is mail slow for you today?" You know, <laughs> it seems a bit slow for me even though I'm sending a large file, I'd say, hey, it, it's slow. And uh, sometimes our users are calling about these services, and these services are not within our data center or not within our immediate scope. They could be out, um, you know, we may have outsourced to uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and we are doing your mail system for you. So 
need to be able to troubleshoot all of these uh, types of, of resources that exist regardless of the where they are within our hybrid IT. So some local, some some uh, uh, out. Traditionally, um, when we look at uh, diag uh, diagnostics, we have designed for a specific set of testing, but we haven't really designed a solution for operating. We train our troubleshooters to focus on the resource within our static test environment, but really not for the dynamic type of infrastructure uh, that we have today. When we look at the uh, change, you know, we all know that change is fared in operations. We don't want any changes to happen there. And because of that, we have a whole bureaucratic process that we have, have developed over the years to prevent change because of fear. However, when we look at our world today, again, continuous development, continuous deployment, what that means is there'll be continuous change also. All right, so we need to be able to facilitate that, and we think the reference model certainly helps with that. And certainly in the part of resolution, uh, when we consider what we had uh, previously, uh, we always needed to balance uh, speed and, and risk. Our systems sometimes have been you know, very fragile. Uh, we may only have a few individuals that have that tribal knowledge to help troubleshoot the problem if it's really complex. But in our dynamic world, you know, the world where we have two key areas that we focus on automation and leveraging social IT for, to, to help some of our issues, uh, where we have our users that may know a little more even than our operation staff, we need to be able to facilitate that. Really, we see that IT is, IT is really moving to a world where we have continuous delivery, and really for the requirement where our systems are always on. So if we actually, as an organization, can really take on that role of you know, continuous delivery, having always on systems, we must in fact have a solution that builds on an integrated service lifecycle model that allows IT the speed that we need, even with appropriate governance. We must always you know learn from our from our issues that exist. Don't fail to, to learn from them, improve them. Therefore, it means that IT knowledge should be continually flowing into our ever increasing dynamic and automated structures. And this is what I think uh, DTC lends us and the whole uh, value stream and reference architecture as a whole. So the takeaway really from this slide is DTC is a value stream that's well suited for this user-centric economy and it supports you know, what we like to call the hybrid, hybrid IT environment, which we see a lot. So let's take an, another look at uh, the reference architecture with a specific view on the uh, D2C value stream. So what we're gonna do in this section, we can just have a quick refresher of the reference architecture and how to read the diagram. Then we'll go into some more detail uh, behind the detect to correct uh, a value stream. So you know this reference architecture, we've seen it before. Um, we know that your organization and most organizations today have heavily invested in best practice processes. You know, these frameworks like ITIL or Corbett, you know, both of them, they work in identifying the what, the what to track. They, they definitely will help us to improve the processes around, you know, maybe our continuous life cycle. However, the problem still remains as to how. How do you track? How do you integrate? How do you manage the data consistently across that, that whole life cycle? And this, of course, is where IT for IT comes in. This is where we, we fill that specific IT management support gap. It's really on the how. So this is what the reference architecture would uh, allow us to do. So you will notice that uh, detect to correct um, is all the way over on the right side after our request to fulfill. So consistent to our overall value stream strategy, the focus again, and I know I keep saying this, the focus is on the data and the functional components. It's not on the process that really compromise, that, that comprise these particular sets of activities. 
So your organization's method, the processes that you already have, whether it's, you know, Agile, whether it's Corbett, ITIL, you know, you're using waterfall uh, type project management uh, practices. The underlying data is really where we actually come in. So let's take a, a deeper look into the, the actual data structure within Detect to Correct. Um, Detect to Correct, again, are the things that we need to put in place to manage the running services. It provides really the framework for integrated monitoring, uh, event detection, uh, what we do in uh, diagnostics, uh, change, and subsequent remediation of all the tasks within the service management environment. The framework is really designed to, to support a variety of sourcing functions, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and processes. So again, regardless of the process, we think uh, D2C really is, is a fit. So D2C actually brings the IT service operations functions together to improve the quality and efficiency, and of course the speed that we're looking for in this uh, new, new, uh, new IT world. So typically today, um, when we think of our organizations and the domains that we have in, in these organizations, what we see is that uh, um, typically they operate in various environments. Uh, today we have multiple domains. They are really not shared. We have our own ecosystem. You know, just, just think of how uh, we actually developed our IT environment. Oftentimes it's really not done organically. It's really a mix and match of, of many different vendors who have a variety of ideas on how things should operate. How do you keep all of this working together, right? And this is where we think uh, the DTC uh, model actually uh, comes in and helps us. So this actual detect to correct model, it exposes a set of key artifacts that are produced and consumed within this value chain. And it really is con makes it consistent across the value stream, allowing that interoperability uh, that we all want from from the initial strategy all the way to uh, delivery. It provides data that is trusted, so and it's meaningful data to everyone, right? Which helps to then break down those silos that we have and gain the efficiencies that we're looking for across, across the organization. So let's take a look at uh, some of the, the key um, uh, artifacts that we have within uh, D2C. So I mentioned the actual service CI. This, again, is part of our backbone uh, that we have, IT service backbone. It allows you to tie everything together. It's the actual CI uh, being deployed. So I mentioned earlier that in, in my particular case, it's actually the running of my, uh, my mail system, right? What I see as an actual user and all of the the dependent CIs associated with that, the network associated with that, the systems that are that are associated with that uh, particular CI, all of those are there that we have in that uh, actual CI, which is in our config configuration management uh, component. Then we have the the service monitor. So remember when we came from uh, request to fulfill, this is where we uh, get the actual service monitors. So actually implementing them, uh, deploying them, um, setting the associated thresholds, this is what we're actually doing in this particular uh, uh, artifact uh, that we have. Uh, I mentioned our configuration management earlier, and that uh, keeps track of all the running services that we have within there. And we have a service contract. So oftentimes in case, in, in my mail example, I have certain service levels that we want to ensure that our customers meet. So, you know, maybe ensuring that our, our mail sync, when we send it, we receive it in, you know, under 10 seconds, or it's, it's uh, very re responsive, or we are able to send, you know, 20 gig, 20 gig files, I don't know, I'm just making that up, 20 gig files or large files, and still get a good response. This is not the actual definition, but as the, uh, the service is actually instantiated, then we initiate this service contract for that running model. Of course, we can have multiple of these, even for the same uh, mail system. 
The service monitoring component that hosts the uh, service monitor, it, uh, it really gives you that uh, service uh, definition. Uh, it helps to correlate events that we have within that environment so that all of operations can see. We have the event component, so when an event is actually generated, the, the uh, correlation, the filtering, the deduplication of that event is what actually occurs here. And you see the uh, associated supporting model, um, which is really the change of state, the supporting model being the, the actual um, event uh, data attribute that actually supports state change. So when there is a change within that environment, able to identify, to notify somebody is really what we're talking in terms of the actual event component. Then there's the run, the, the actual run book data model. So you have an event, but you want to help diagnose what the issue is and even to remediate. This is what the run books are for. And this is how they actually help. The run book really is, is comprised of a set of routine procedures and tasks that could be made by a, an administrator. You know, we all remember the days when you would get a, uh, a disk full error or you're running out of space on, on your system. One of the first things that you did is you went and you cleaned up the temp space. So automating that to run a script, if, you know, space is above, uh, um, you know, 90%, clean up the temp files, that's an example of a rudimentary example, by the way, of really um, a runbook. So, you know, we have many uh, certain vendors that provide a lot of these runbooks. Many people actually create them. It's really to help automate the remediation and the diagnostics of your particular environment. Even, you know, going back to our mail example, um, you know, if my mail is running slow uh, and I call up, being able to collect all the measurements, not only for my service level, but for performance, for capacity, end-to-end, -end, whether it's in cloud or on-premise, of those systems, and then initiating a runbook to help resolve the issue if it's remediated, if it can be quickly remediated, is really how we want to drive that automation uh, within your systems. But certainly we know that there are times when uh, we actually need to create an incident, and uh, oftentimes, you know, there is, uh, you know, incident takes many, many different forms, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be in what we call an incident management system. We see even today where people, you know, will send an email, right, to your SaaS provider, um, <clears throat> and that in turn from a help desk goes into uh, what's known as an incident behind the scenes, which really tells them that something needs to be fixed, right, to initiate the way in which we can fix that. Then subsequently, the ability to take that incident, in some cases people have a, a robust problem management uh, type of uh, 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 process, other times people don't. Um, taking the problem, understanding the known error, that may be associated with that, and hopefully uh, getting that resolved uh, in the next stage that there is a deployment is really what the function of this particular um, uh, component is, functional component, and its associated uh, data model. So we've, we've talked about now that we've seen how we can, uh, the functional components are, we got a good description of what they are within uh, the detect to correct area. What I want to do now um, is simply take a look at how they interact. So how do these functional components interact uh, not only with each other, but with other aspects of the, uh, of the, uh, the value chain, or other, um, other value stream, other value streams within that value chain. So you would see in this particular diagram, this is the uh, level two, and the level two diagram really uh, consists of the, the value streams. And there are a couple of things to note. The, the blue boxes that you see here, they are the same as we saw in the previous diagram. They represent the functional components, and you remember these black dots as uh, the actual data objects within these functional components and the black lines. There are a couple other things that we're introducing here. There are these gray boxes. 
These are functional components, but they are not owned by detect to correct value stream. In this case, this one is owned by a request to fulfill. Remember when we talked earlier about the service, um, the service monitoring uh, a component of that's really we get that data and what to monitor in terms of the the metric attributes. We get that really coming in from the request to fulfill. So there is this particular request to fulfill um, a functional component that then interacts with what we have our functional component in in uh, the D2C in the D2C uh, uh, value stream. The red lines that you see here, we recognize that within the industry today, it's these are practices that exist, not that we recommend them, but we realize that they exist, and so we make allocation for them within the reference architecture. You know, one of the prime examples, uh, you know, people close to ITIL and following the process would say, if we have a defect really should only come from the problem component. But really, in practice, in many organizations today, we have defects being generated from an incident. So we know it's a practice uh, that exists today. And in our subsequent updates to the reference uh, architecture, we will certainly highlight um, some of these uh, practices and uh, give some recommendations actually around them. So in addition to functional components, we saw the relationships. Uh, another critical part of how of uh, actually this data object are the essential attributes. So I don't have a slide for the essential attributes, in fact, but they are available in the standard. So when you download the standard and you look at the D2C uh, value stream or any of the other value streams, you'll see a set of essential attributes. And this is key, especially in a multi-vendor environment. So today, I may have event component, and I'm running the technology based on Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I may have my incident component based on the solution from, from IBM, or I may have a problem component or even a uh, remediation and diagnostics from you know, Chef or something that, uh, from one of our uh, other vendors that are out there. How do we, as an IT organization, ensure that we can deliver that whole value to our, to our customers. The only way that we can do that, again, focusing on the data, is through not only the functional components, not only through the, the uh, data objects, but the, also the essential attributes associated with those data objects. So we have then the same taxonomy across vendors. So certainly the goal of IT for IT, and especially within D2C where we, we rarely see this happening, is to, as vendors become um, you know, certified on the uh, IT for IT reference architecture, they will be speaking the same language. So if you have you know, a component for an IBM, or for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, or for ServiceNow, the language that they talk would be the same. They will have those same essential attributes to allowing you to have that interaction and sharing uh, that end-to-end -end view that we so much uh, desire. So this is how, as we come to a close, um, this is really the details around the uh, D2C area. So let me just quickly, I know we come into and take a look at, at the why. You know, why is really D2C uh, important? The key value proposition in adopting uh, DTC is really around efficiency, so timely identification and prioritization of an issue, uh, improving data sharing to accelerate the ability through collaboration to accelerability of identifying business impact, and then prioritizing uh, issue resolution, and then providing the data that we need early to, to run from an end-to-end -end, uh, type environment. This is the, the detect to, to correct value stream. It definitely helps IT by leveraging uh, through this whole integration and uh, collaboration. So how can we actually substantiate you know, these claims of benefits that we, we say DTC provides? It's only through KPIs, right? And we have a, a number of uh, KPIs. So within really our particular area of uh, DTC, um, we, we have KPIs about reducing the number of incidents. Uh, that we have, 
um, you know, reducing mean time to repair, reducing the outages caused by by changes, et cetera. All of these are uh, KPIs that uh, we have within the Detect to Correct um, a value stream. So again, we know that your organization is heavily invested in you know these process frameworks like ITIL, et cetera, and that tells you certainly some of the what. What we do in D2C, what we do with IT5T is tell you the how. IT5T fills the gap in the IT management and supports you with the how of data integration and our data management. So you can control the full service lifecycle, report back to the business, how our service is doing, not just simply on what we're doing with the technology. So with that, what do I want you to do? What is your call to action? And here is where uh, you come in. You can certainly contribute. We have been at this for, what, three, four years now in developing the standard. Uh, it's always developing. I know it's continual. And certainly we would uh, relish your involvement and your support. You can certainly download the collateral from our site. You have also access to customer testimonials. You have a number of white papers. There are some really great webinars that go into you know, some of the other value streams that I would strongly recommend that you view if you haven't done so. And certainly, you have the ability to uh, collaborate uh, with our experts. So in summary, this is what we provide with IT5T. And the Detect a Correct value stream is a major contributor uh, to that. So I know we are running out of time. So let me turn now over to uh, Chris. Hopefully this was helpful. And hopefully we have a number of questions or comments that uh, we can certainly help answer. Chris, over to you. Super. Thank you very much, Dwight. And thank you, everybody, for your um, attention and the insightful questions that have been asked. Um, the first and probably the most foremost question arose in relation to a comparison between IT for IT and ITIL. Um, this is highly complementary. Um, we in the forum believe that this is a space in the IT service management landscape that's persisted for over 30 years, despite the efforts of many frameworks and tools, ITIL, COBIT, and others amongst them. The IT for IT reference architecture is specific to the business of IT. And you've heard Dwight today speak to the fourth of four value streams. What it offers is complementarity in the shape of prescriptive, off-the-shelf guidance for architects designing, running, and delivering services and products in that space. So it's not a competitor, but it's definitely complementary. I won't ask Dwight to run back through the slide deck because I think that would be kind of disruptive but I would make an observation in terms of format. We have a very cohesive technical standard, which is presented at a number of levels of abstraction. So if we, if you will, zoom out to the CIO perspective of this, in other words, if you or Dwight or any of us were to say to your CIO, I think this offers us some business benefit, the value stream presentation, that 50,000 foot level, gives an immediate indication of that margin of efficiency, that value add to the right-hand side of the value chain, which immediately is understood by people in the business of resourcing, mail systems, and all of the other things that Dwight has talked to us about. If you zoom down through the levels that Dwight has spoken about today, you actually get to the detail of how to build this into the configuration management database in your organization. So what Dwight has done with us today is to move between the uppermost and mid levels of abstraction of the technical standard. So to those of you that asked about missing the cost of detect to correct, that's not the case. We have complementary value streams in there, substantial KPIs, and as you can see in the supporting activities, 
we have a whole work group building the intelligence and reporting tools that will dashboard this for the executive sponsors. At the same time, you can see one of the supporting activities is governance, risk and compliance. So the ITIL assets that you have in your organization are accommodated by the IT for IT reference architecture. The piece that's new is this off the shelf prescriptive guidance that gives you, if you will, recipe card like guidance, which today has been absent in this space. The standard today has been downloaded well over 4,000 times from the Open Group's website, so the potential of it is clearly appreciated. It is different, it is new, there is still much work to be done. We meet again face to face in San Francisco at the end of January, but we welcome further questions and potential contributions. Um, Marianne asks whether or not the IT for IT white papers are on the Open Group website. Yes, indeed they are, Marianne, but you need to be um, a member of the Open Group. I would like to assume that you are. You also need to be a member of our forum. Um, so if Simon or I can help you with that, um, all of the white papers are available for download, those that are complete, the ones that are in progress are obviously on our collaboration portal, Plato, for those of you that are in the open group and know about that. So if there is a white paper which is still in formulation, um, we would appreciate your help to uh, further develop that aspect of the collateral. So a a question from Carlos who asks, is there any kind of certification for professionals, professionals considered in the future? Um, I will make the bold move as the chairman of the forum telling you that we have an agenda item which is to announce the availability of people certification um, which will be made at the Open Group Conference in San Francisco probably on the Tuesday of the last week. So we are currently beta testing the um, certification materials, but we are ready to launch that before the end of this month. So this is a very mature endeavor. Um, Dwight and I have been involved with it for a number of years. Um, we conservatively estimate that the technical standard together with its supporting white paper guides and so on and so forth, the substantial Sparks repository, which as we speak is being converted to an Archimate representation. All of those things collectively represent some 20 to 25 man years of work. So this is, despite its, if you will, newness in the open group, this is a substantial technical endeavor, which is um, substantive and ready to offer benefit and those gains of efficiency in your organization. I've paused there because I see no more questions appearing in the Q&A window. So before I hand back to Simon, I'll just thank Dwight once again and thank you all for your contributions. If you do have a question, now is the time to type into the Q&A window towards the bottom right of your screen. And uh, I'll now briefly hand back to Simon and monitor that window. In okay, case, Chris. Yep. Um, yeah, there's another question about the CMDB coming into slide 17. Got that one, that's quite technical. That's something that gets, it, that is addressed, it's work in progress but it's actually, if you will, below the waterline in terms of visibility for this level presentation at the moment. Yeah, we'll certainly talk more about that in uh, San Francisco. And uh, there's a lot of more detail on really CMDB within our document. So we'll really uh, value yeah. your input on that. Yeah. So for, for those that, that just to, to clarify, since you have the slide on the screen, what um, Dwight is sharing now is the value stream at level two, 
level one is the value chain itself. Level two is what you see. We push down through levels three, four, and five when the fine detail of data attributes relevant to configuration management databases, plural, becomes very specific to products and services that you would be responsible for the configuration, planning, running, and delivery of. So we are there, but it's not immediately evident from this level of presentation in this webinar. Okay, Simon, back to you. Thanks again, everybody.